Chaim Shaharazani, and in the news, a failed attempt by some members of the Boston JCRC to oust the ZOA. After a lengthy process that included allegations of white supremacy and even support for anti-Semites, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Boston, the JCRC, voted against expelling the Zionist Organization of America, ZOA, after several progressive groups sought its ouster. The final vote took place on April 27th and ended with 40 votes to expel, 48 against, and 10 abstentions. According to the bylaws of the Boston JCRC, a two-thirds majority of members present is required to expel a member. The decision came after two key committees of the JCRC also voted against expelling the ZOA earlier in the month. No matter what your thoughts are on Jewish politics or where you stand, it's clear that this measure represents yet another level of polarization and political escalation within the Jewish community. So what exactly happened and what does it mean? To discuss this important issue, I'm pleased to have with me today on JBS, Mort Klein. Mort is a frequent guest on JBS and is the national president of the Zionist Organization of America, the oldest pro-Israel group in the United States, founded in 1897. Klein is an economist who served in the Nixon, Ford, and Carter administrations and served as a biostatistician at UCLA School of Public Health and the Linus Pauling Institute of Science and Medicine in Palo Alto, California. Klein has also been a lecturer in mathematics and statistics at Temple University, and I'm very pleased to have him with me today. Mort, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure having you on JBS. Great to be with you, thank you. So just to dive straight into the matter, what exactly happened? The extreme left organizations of JCRC Boston, and I, they really shouldn't even be called extreme left, they're really anti-Israel. <laughs> J Street, uh, New Israel Fund, uh, Keshet, which is the LD, LGBTQ organization, uh, Workman's Circle, uh, had a petition saying that ZOA and I should be thrown off the board of the JCRC because we are racist and white supremacist. They say we are racist because I can, simply because I condemn the organization Black Lives Matter, not black people. The organization whose charter calls Israel a genocidal apartheid state. They say the Israeli police are training U.S. police to murder blacks. <laughs> Last week, they said their explicit goal is Israel's destruction. I condemn them as anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. That's my job. <laughs> and another reason they said that I'm racist is because I retweeted Thomas Sowell, a major black intellectual who said racism in America is on the wane. It's not getting worse. I retweeted that. <laughs> and he happened to be a black intellectual. When, in addition, they, yes. Sorry, more. When, uh, when did you tweet out those comments? What time period? Mm -hmm. you <laughs> Thomas Sowell was only in the last few weeks. Black Lives Matter was last summer when I wrote articles detailing their charter. Alan Dershowitz called them anti Semitic, Caroline Glick, Ruthie Bloom, Melanie Phillips. They are. Again, it's the organization. I'm not condemning blacks. Any organization, white, black, Asian, Muslim, who, who attacks Israel or Jews wrongly, I will go after them. It's my job. <laughs> and so it's nonsense to call me racist. They also call me a white supremacist. Can you believe this? <laughs> and on what the basis they call me a white supremacist? <laughs> because I went many times on Sebastian Gorka's show. First of all, he's not a white supremacist. He's a great Zionist and a lover of Israel. And on the show, I don't discuss white supremacy. I promote Israel and the Jewish people. And they say, because I go on the show who they claim is a white supremacist, they claim I'm elevating white supremacy. <laughs> In addition, the second basis was that I retweeted Stephen King. Stephen King had made some troubling remarks uh, about white supremacy and he apologized profusely. I retweeted him once. What did I retweet? A beautiful picture on Veterans Day. He had of, of armed forces or of, of American soldiers not about white supremacy. I retweeted a beautiful picture he had. In addition, 
<laughs> they say I'm Islamophobe because I've condemned Hayas. Why do I condemn Hayas? <laughs> because they work with Islamic Relief. This is a terrorist organization on Israel's list of terrorist groups. They've defended anti-Semite Linda Sarsour and they resettle Syrians and Iraqis and others who according to ADL and the Pew Foundation, 90% of these people are anti-Semitic. I as a Jew don't want anti-Semites coming to America. I don't care that they're Muslims. If they were Hindus or Buddhists or Christians, if they're anti-Semitic, I don't want them here. Just like my friends in the black community say, they don't want Afrikaners from South Africa coming to America because those Afrikaners hate blacks. So because I fight to keep anti-Semites out of America, they call me an Islamophobe. Uh, and in addition, because I've condemned Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, two Muslims, I condemn them because they condemn Israel as evil, as racist. They support BDS. They want to cut all aid to Israel. I don't condemn them because they're Muslims. It's because of what they say and do. But thank God, sanity prevailed. And the overwhelming number of JCRC board and council members uh, refused to uh, remove ZOA from the JCRC board. So, so Mort, let me emphasize this. So first of all, about Black Lives Matter, BLM, you were talking about last summer. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, you know, tensions were high, emotions were running high, but at the end of the day, your focus was not at all about the issue being, you know, um, mm -hmm. anti-black, but rather focusing on Black Lives Matter agenda and platform. Tell us a little bit about that platform that you object to. <laughs> in writing their platform, which they've never announced. It says Israel's a genocidal state whose goal is to murder as, uh, uh, all the Arabs, is an apartheid state, another lie, and that Israeli police train US police to murder black people. And only two weeks ago, one of the leading activists of Black Lives Matter said, the explicit goal of Black Lives Matter is the destruction of Israel and promoting BDS. Why is not every group condemning Black Lives, Jewish group especially? Where's ADL? Where's the Conference of Presidents? Where's B'nai B'rith and, and the American Jewish Committee? Where is the JCRC of Boston? They should be condemning Black Lives Matter. I'm condemning them because of their policies, not because they're Black. I'm not interested in the color of their skin. When I condemn the Ku Klux Klan because of being anti-white, anti-Black and anti-Israel, I'm not condemning white people. I'm condemning that organization, the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> and it's really remarkable. The, 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 the anti-Israel groups that went after us, and it was only the anti-Israel groups, J Street, J Street just brought into their conference a week ago, Jimmy Carter, a, a hateful toward Israel, Mahmoud Abbas, who pays Arabs to murder Jews, Salam al Mariati, who publicly says Israel should not exist, <laughs> BDS speakers, Ilan Omar, they bring in horrible anti-Israel people, and nobody says a word. And they have the chutzpah to say that I'm harmful to the Jewish community by condemning our enemies while they bring our enemies into their conferences and praise them. And New Israel Fund, who is another petition signer, they fund NGOs to defame Israel, to promote BDS. They help pay for lawyers who defend Palestinian Arab murderers of Jews. And these people have the audacity to attack us, along with Keshet and the Workmen's Circle, who support BDS. And they've even compared the, the, the Pittsburgh murder of 11 Jews to Israelis killing Gaza Arabs. It's unbelievable how awful these people are. And by the way, if, let me just say one more thing. They call me a racist. In my last gala, I had Ice Cube, a famous black rapper, as one of my major speakers who condemned anti-Semitism publicly, and Chiron Skinner, uh, a, a black woman, an African-American woman, who was the head of policy planning at the State Department, praising Israel and condemning anti-Semitism. Uh, racists don't bring black people to their conferences. Mort, let me ask you something. What's happening here in the American political discourse <laughs> and the Jewish American political discourse when we all agree that we're anti-racism and we need to stand up against <laughs> racism, but when come, there comes a moment to criticize an organization, even when it does other issues that we may agree with, people hesit are hesitant to do so and move uh, in, in the, forward in the direction of some sort of a cancel culture telling you that it's inappropriate or unacceptable when you criticize them for something that you believe definitely is worth the criticism. Look, if David Duke 
the racist Jew hater of the Ku Klux Klan would say something good about health care or about a welfare or whatever, I would still condemn him for being an anti-Semite and a black hater. <laughs> Once you're a hater, I don't care what else you say. It's irrelevant to me. But that doesn't mean I don't support uh, that black lives matter. Of course, black lives matter. Of course, Jewish lives matter and Israeli lives matter. Of course, I support that with my heart and soul. But the goal of J Street, the anti-Israel J Street, the anti-Israel New Israel Fund, the anti-Israel Workers Circle and Keshet is not, is, is to destroy the credibility of those people like ZOA who disagree with their positions. That is the reason they've done this. They knew the odds of getting, of that be, our being voted out was very small, but the goal wasn't that. The real goal was harm more clients in ZOA's credibility so no one should listen to them because they uh, support the right of Jews to live in the Jewish state in, in, in Judea and Samaria. They oppose the Palestinian state because the Palestinian state will be a terrorist state. They hate our positions. They see that people listen to us. They want people to stop listening to us. That is the reason for this cancel culture of the anti-Israel Jewish groups. Moritz, uh, between Hayes and the JCRC in Boston, do you think we've lost the ability to agree to disagree and still remain under the same umbrella organization? Consensus agreements are now not possible. The right and the left are so uh, different in their views about Israel that there's really no consensus uh, possible. We've lost that ability. And so consensus groups like JCRC and the Conference of Presidents, they can only come out with platitudes and with really uh, simple statements that don't take a strong stand because half their people will object. <laughs> it's a real problem. And, and frankly, organizations like J Street, New Israel Fund, and Hayas, I, I don't know why they're uh, involved in a Jewish organization. They shouldn't even be there. Mort, um, Israel used to be perceived at least as a unifying factor uh, in, in the Jewish community. It, mm -hmm. no, it doesn't seem like that's the case anymore. You know, that's a really very interesting question. Uh, people are now, we have uh, organizations now on d different sides of the issues that affect Israel. APAC does not support the right of Jews to live in Judea and Samaria. APAC supports the Palestinian state. Uh, APAC does fundraisers for senators who voted in favor of the Iran deal, which was a disaster. And then you have people like me on our side feeling completely the opposite. Uh, Unfortunately, Israel has now become uh, an issue where people fight about as opposed to where people come, come together and say, thank God we have a Jewish state. And, and it's wrong. We should, no matter how we feel about these issues, we should always be grateful and thankful that we, are, that we have a Jewish state. We have a powerful Jewish army to protect Jews uh, where people can live a full Jewish life. You know, uh, we've forgotten about that. We, you know, at the end of the day, and that's the reason I have this painting, it's to oh, for, oh, forever remembering what the cost is of Jewish fragmentation, because at the end of the day, the fact that we have a Jewish state today is indeed a great gift, and we should all <laughs> hold on to it. Um, and in this regard, I want to ask you, we've seen this attempt in Boston, which failed. Have you seen any other attempts across the country of trying to house the COA from different organizational frameworks? Or is this a Massachusetts style area? No, we had 16 Jewish organizations sign a letter condemning me and ZOA for criticizing Black Lives Matter. <laughs> the reform movement, the conservative movement, <laughs> National Council of Jewish Women, Amenu, and many, and many other group, Jewish groups condemned us, which is unbelievable. And they took out a full page ad in the New York Times, 600 organizations, Jewish, and Jewish leaders supporting Black Lives Matter, even though they're an anti-Israel, anti-Semitic organization. <laughs> but there has been no movement uh, to try and, and remove ZOA from any organization. It would fail miserably if that happened. It was only the anti-Israel groups in Massachusetts, J Street, New Israel Fund, Keshet Workers Circle, and Women of Reform Judaism that had this petition. The mainstream Jewish groups in Boston did support ZOA on this issue. It was only the anti-Israel far left that uh, attacked us on after us. So there is still hope. Thank you so much, Mort, for joining us today.
Thank you so much for allowing me to be with you, your important program. Thank you. As a result of the Boston JCRC situation we just discussed with Mord, JNS's Jonathan Tobin published a scathing article criticizing the vote and questioning whether umbrella organizations like the Conference of Presidents or local JCRCs really can and should exist in the future. I'm pleased to have Jonathan with us today to share his perspective on the matter. Jonathan Tobin is editor-in-chief of JNS.org, the Jewish News Syndicate. His opinion columns appear in JNS on a daily basis. He's also a contributing writer for the National Review, the New York Post, the Federalist, Haaretz, the New York Jewish Week, the Gatestone Institute, and to Israeli magazine Mida. He's a frequent commentator on domestic politics, Israel, and Jewish affairs, and a very welcome guest here on JBS. Jonathan, welcome. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. So first and foremost, pursuant to our discussion with Mort, how do you view what happened at the Boston JCRC? Well, I think it's um, <clears throat> one more chapter in an ongoing saga of the you know, bifurcation of the American Jewish community in which much like the rest of America of, of American political culture, Jews are splitting apart. Um, we're not part of one big tent, one big community, despite all the lip service that is uh, given to those concepts. We are like other Americans um, split into um, and, and engaged in a, what can only be described as a tribal culture war. Um, you know, we're living in a time where religion is largely, you know, politics has taken the role that religion used to play for most people. And that's why debates are so bitter and why it's very hard for people to view those with whom they disagree as just neighbors, congregants, you know, fellow citizens with whom you can't agree to disagree. You've got to demonize them. You've got to view them as the other. And I think that's why these umbrella groups, it started last year with the Conference of Presidents, um, where it seemed like they were coming apart. And now this JCRC vote shows again that uh, the two sides are not really willing to live with each other and see each other as part of one big community. And, and that's, that's the overall look at this. The details make it even more bitter. Right. But, you know, um, we used to, this specific crisis was around an American political issue, Black Lives Matter and that entire situation. We used to think about the support for Israel as some sort of a political iron dome that prevented these issues from entering the camp. And there is this topic that unifies us and that keeps us together. So my question is, you know, two layered. One, is Israel still that or has it ever been? And two, what's the future if politics is allowed, like you just mentioned, to, uh, you know, wreak havoc internally? Well, number one, it's never been entirely the case that Israel was a unifying factor. In crises, you know, in May 1967 and October 1973, sure, it was a, a very strong unifying factor. But the truth is, I mean, a history of America, of American Jews in Israel has always been uh, one where we're more, you know, we disagree as much as we agree. And the notion of the old um, you know, United Jewish Appeal slogan of we are one was always more aspirational than actually descriptive. Um, so Israel, and, and as far as today, Israel is a deeply divisive issue within the Jewish community. We are more split on Israel than non-Jews are split on Israel. Non-Jews are on the whole very supportive. American Jews are very strongly divided uh, along political and religious lines uh, about Israel. And this, this is a piece of what happened with, as you say, the, the way the Black Lives Matter movement um, issue helped divide Jews. And that was the, the crux of the, the Boston debate. Um, so what Mark Klein is under fire for quote unquote, elevating voices of white supremacy. And what that means in shorthand means that he disagreed with Black Lives Matter. He disagreed with the, the idea of critical race theory being um, determinative and something that we should all basically take the knee to. Um, he was right to do that, in my opinion. But whether or not he was right, uh, these are things which in a democracy, uh, you know, reasonable people can disagree and debate about. Indeed, they must be just be debated. They can't be just taken as, as if they were 
religion, but unfortunately people take politics as religion. And so it was only natural that people on the left were going to take um, a Jewish organization taking issue with Black Lives Matter and the whole, you know, everything that happened last summer and, and the way the culture ha is being impacted by that issue and to take it as evidence of not merely being wrong, but being evil being white supremacist, being a racist, you know, Mort, Mort is many things, Mort, you, know, this, you know, he's, he's a pugnacious fighter um, and his political opponents don't like him. Well, you know, so what? But he's not a racist. Um, what he is is someone who is disagreeing about an issue that the left doesn't think anybody should disagree with. And, you know, that is a function of American politics and Amer the way American culture works now. I, I want to exactly focus on what you said. Instead of just condemning whatever it is that they may have thought that Mort said incorrectly, they chose to go head on into the arena of let's get him out of the room. And it all seems to be very much connected to the notion of cancel culture today in the US. Mort just told me that his appearance on Sebastian Gorka's show uh, labels him in a certain color, not what he said on the show, not what Sebastian may have told him on the show, but the fact that he was there already um, justifies getting, him out, getting it out of the room. So is this really part of this cancel culture? And what does the future hold in this regard for, for the Jewish politics in America? Cancel culture is inextricably tied to these issues. I mean, you can't separate it. It's part of it. Um, that is the basically it's <clears throat> it's like Marx's dialectic. It, it is it is part of the process whereby you identify somebody as a white, you know, we in sort of this critical race theory view of the world, we're all classified by our race, by our status as one of the oppressed or one of the oppressors. If you sit with the oppressors, or identified as, just as Israel is wrongly dis, you know, described as an oppressor apartheid state, oppressing the indigenous people of, of, of the land of Israel who are the Jews, and the majority of Jews who live there are by the definitions accepted by American leftist people of color because they're Mizrahim. But the point is, if you sit with Sebastian Gorka, <clears throat> who's a Trump supporter, somebody demonized by the right, even though, you know, by the left, excuse me, who is not even that important, let's be honest, um, then you too, you're, you're, it's guilt by association. And that's the way this works. That's the way people get canceled. Um, it, it's, it's always the dynamic. And is this uh, reversible in your opinion, uh, Jonathan? Well, nothing in politics is permanent. <laughs> You know, nothing, no, nothing is ever permanent. Everything always changes, but the trend is in this direction. We're a long way from getting through this. We're just first getting into it. Um, we've, this is only a year old in the way it dominates our, our politics. Um, and it's now leaching into Jewish communal politics. Uh, we're, we're deep into it. It's not going away anytime soon. And what it's going to require, if you, if you say, what's, you know, where, where do we see the light at the end of the tunnel to stop this cancel culture? It's going to require liberals, you know, the Jewish left, realizing that this is not in their interests, realizing that these ideas about critical race theory and white fragility are illiberal ideas. They are, they are the opposite of what the values, uh, the that traditional Jewish liberalism of liberalism with a small L um, has always believed in. And they are really toxic for our culture in general and especially toxic for Jews because they're a permission slip for anti-Semitism because Jews are identified as white and, and uh, beneficiaries of white privilege and therefore must be um, taken down a notch or two in the name of equity. This is a direct threat to Jewish interests. It's a direct threat to Zionism and it, it, it goes hand in hand with the BDS movement. You know, it's all of a piece. You can't separate any part of it. And once we start canceling um, uh, people for being conservatives or questioning um, Black Lives Matter, everybody, you know, everything's on the table. So, but it must be the Jewish left that understands this and fights it. Uh, it's fine for me as a conservative. Nobody, nobody on the left is listening to Mort, you know, <laughs> let's, let's start there. But it, it, it is important for liberals to fight for liberalism. Um, true liberals are being driven out of Jewish communal life 
And as long as that is happening, we're not going to beat it. Um, once we turn the tide on that and Jewish liberals understand um, how this is a threat to their basic values, the threat to the Jewish community at whole, um, then we'll have a chance to, to get through it, but not until then. Jonathan, we'll I'm see. really concerned about our future generation because we have um, you know, Jewish kids go on college campuses. They come from diverse homes and diverse political views. And when they, you know, in their young age, when they make their first steps into this arena of public opinion, suddenly they may get the feeling that they can't utter some of the positions they truly feel. And this is really stifling more than just free speech. It's, it's stifling a much deeper sense of, of you know, society that we all share here uh, in the US and, and beyond. Oh, I think you're absolutely right about that. That's, that's why it's so toxic um, because it is, the, it is the death of free speech and it's also deeply intimidating. It's it's a it's about it's more than just our, our old, you know, really almost quaint arguments about free speech, what you can say where. This is about the whole concept of free expression and whether open debate about any issue is is possible anymore. Um, and quite frankly, uh, those who are espousing these very toxic concept about white privilege. And, um, and, and critical race theory, they are in a liberal movement. They don't want free expression. They don't want um, open debate. They don't want to, you know, the old, you, you, you uh, paraphrase the old Voltaire quote, you know, I will disagree with you, but I'll fight for the debt to the death for your right to say it. They don't believe that. They're very open about not believing it. They want you to shut up. If, if, you, if you don't agree with them. And they're determined to shut you up, drive you out, put you in, and in a Jewish context, put you in cherem, which is what the whole, that JCRC debate was about. We won't sit with you as long as you disagree with us about anything. And that's, um, you know, that, that, that's a, a direct threat to a, you know, a functioning Jewish community. It's a direct threat to a free society. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for your clarion voice. And I recommend all of our viewers to read your uh, latest on JNS uh, uh, with regards to what happened in Boston, as it is so important for the, our future and the future of our community. Thank you for your time, Jonathan. Thanks so much. I'd like to thank my guests today again, Mort Klein and Jonathan Tobin, for enlightening us on this crucial issue for the future of the Jewish community. The Talmud reminds us that kol Israel arevim zelaze, meaning all of Israel are responsible for each other. Israel recently experienced a terrible tragedy in Meron during Lagba Omer, where 45 innocent people lost their lives. It was then that amidst an Israeli political turmoil that you saw Israelis of all color and creed come together. They came together to support the bereaved families to attend the funerals, to give blood in Tel Aviv's Rabin Square, and to gather and light candles in the memory of those lost. Jewish unity stands above all. I hope we all remember this principle, which stands above politics, and act on it. Sadly, history has taught us where Jewish fragmentation leads and what unity promises. Let us learn the lessons of the past and may we find unity, not just in death and agony, but also in life. Amen. And to all we say, thank you very much for watching. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay happy. I'd like to thank our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, our technical manager, Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to our wonderful, wonderful producer of In The News, Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shachar Azani. Until next time, see you soon. Shalom and Lehidra.